Are we on here? All right. Yeah, I, was, I was actually going to warn you that we might get this little blessing and before things going. They, they were actually, I think, planning to do it midway through my message. So actually, being back at Wynema right now and being around some of the people here has brought back some, some traumatic memories for me. And I, <laughs> I, I thought you know, it would be cathartic for me to kind of share them with you. This, our intimate little group, you don't mind if I do that, right? That'd be OK just because I think it would make me feel better. So I, I'm just thinking back to a time of, about 30 years ago. And, and I was, Linda and I were running around with our kids and uh, we were touching base with churches and I was doing recruiting for Pioneer Bible Translators and we were trying to, to help people understand what Bible translation was all about. And, and in the process of doing this running around and talking to churches, I, I encountered this young man and, and I was really impressed with him. I mean, he was very bright, he was dynamic, he was gifted. His name was, uh, his name was Joe. Just a second, I think we have more pictures coming here. <laughs> hey there. We're doing on the stairs over here? No. Oh. Okay. There we go. There we go. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Hi. Anyway, back to my sad story. So this fellow's name was Joe, Joe, Joe Hoover. And, um, and, you know, I talked to talking to Joe, and I thought this guy would be so great. And he was interested in Pioneer Bible Translators. And I, so I talked to him, and I thought that I had him totally convinced to join us in Papua New Guinea. I mean, it looked like this is a guy I wanted on my team. You know, and, and we were looking so forward to having him join us over there and being, we'd be the team in, in the world right then. And, and so, you know, we went back to Papua New Guinea and Joe ended up going down to Dallas to get his linguistics training to get ready to go to the field. And then we heard rumors that, that these other people from West Africa were going down to Dallas and were talking to people that were, you know, in, the, in their educational process down there. And, and there were people like, like uh, Greg Pruitt, and, and then I found there was a guy named Brad Willits that was going to be talking to Joe. And, and I said, Lord, not, not Brad Willits, because Brad will mess with his mind. Brad will confuse him. He will, he will brainwash him, and he will convince him that he should be going to the old Passe Guinea in West Africa instead of the new what's happening Guinea in the South Pacific. <laughs> and and I, we were thousands of miles away. I could do nothing to stop it. And that's exactly what happened. And I, I, I wanted to get that off my chest just to let you know what kind of people you're dealing with here. <laughs> I feel better. I feel somewhat better. Okay, on to the Great Commission, all right? Now, I love reading books, don't you? I mean, typically I'm reading at least four books at any one time. I'll have one in my office, one by the couch at home, and a couple on my tablet that I'll read when going to sleep or just biding my time in a waiting room someplace. And some are fiction, I, I really love mysteries. Some are academic because I want to keep my job, and some are just things I'm interested in because I'm curious. So on my tablet, I have the Amazon Kindle app, and I've signed up for something they call Kindle Unlimited, which allows me to pay a low subscription, whoa, a low subscription rate every month, and thereby have access to hundreds of books that I can read without having to buy them. It's kind of an online library with a monthly fee so that I can make regular contributions to Jeff Bezos' retirement account. <laughs> like he needs my help. I can have up to 10 books or magazines checked out at any one time. And a, a lot of newly published authors, as well as a few oldies, have their books available on this service. So whenever I check out a book by an author I don't know, I never know exactly what to expect. And that's fine, you know, because it doesn't cost me anything more if I decide it's not worth finishing and return it. But there's this subconscious quirk in my brain that says, look, you've invested several hours reading through this thing. You don't want to go to all that effort and have it go to waste, so finish the book. 
Why, why return it when you don't know how it ends yet? And I know, you know, it's a stupid way to think. And I can't begin to tell you the amount of time I've wasted reading things that were doing nothing but destroying my brain cells. It's the intellectual equivalent of throwing more money into an investment after you've already got this strong sense that the business is failing and economic, economists have a name for this. It's called the sunk cost fallacy. And there's a time when wisdom dictates that we cut our losses, right? Occasionally, in the books I've downloaded, the writing is so terrible that even I think I can't stand to keep on reading. But I always try to give the author more than a fair chance to redeem themselves before I decide to pull the plug. And I never pull the plug, and so far they've never redeemed themselves. So <laughs> I need counseling. That's what I mean. Well, this happened to me just recently. It was a book by someone I had never heard of before. And it was kind of a mystery thriller, and the writing wasn't exactly terrible. And I was getting into it a little, but the story started with the protagonist, an FBI agent, finding a body on her front porch. And somehow this victim, who was a stranger, had in his hand a piece of paper with her name on it. This was even the quick summary that Amazon had on its website for, to, to convince you to read the book. And later in the story, our hero discovered a picture of herself as a young girl, along with her late parents, standing next to this victim. So I was hooked. I needed to know what was going on here. But that was the end of it. The author got caught up with other parts of the story and forgot to explain who this person was, what they were there for, or how or why they were killed. By the end of the story, it's as if that body had never been discovered. Now, I would have thrown this book across the room, but it was an e-book on my tablet, and that was an expensive Christmas present. <laughs> You know, this is the capital sin of storytelling, bringing in characters that end up having nothing to do with your storyline and leaving their presence unexplained. It's an act of betrayal to the readers. Because every good uh, story writer knows, every good storyteller, every skilled writer of history or competent criminal investigator or professional journalist knows that there are six questions that have to be answered when you put together a narrative. And those questions need to be answered with regard to every key element of the narrative, and they are who, what, when, where, why, and how. Here I was reading a story that began with a captivating, mysterious body, but the, the author never explained who this victim was, why they were there, how they died, or who killed them. I think it was one of those things where the author got this great idea, got to a certain point, couldn't figure out how to resolve the problem, put the book on the back burner, later decided to pick it back up again and forgot to go back and read everything they'd written before. <laughs> but those questions, I think, also need to be in the mind of a good reader if we're going to interact with the narrative properly, whether it's a piece of fiction or something that actually happened. Things are included for a reason. Things are supposed to be connected and going somewhere. And this is the reason why our common approach to scripture can be so incredibly misguided. Because those of us who have been brought up in the church and have learned memory verses and listened to sermons on isolated texts and read bits of scripture on billboards and posters like Christian memes, and if you don't know what a meme is, you need to ask your grandkids, we've gotten the sense that because the Bible is inspired, we can grab pieces of it out of context and out of the narrative it belongs to, and somehow it's supposed to act like a magic formula that makes us more Christian. And the more familiar a text is, the more likely it is we'll forget to ask those six questions about it. The Great Commission is one of those texts. It so happens that the writer of the Gospel of Matthew was not only inspired, he was incredibly skilled at putting together a narrative in which everything ties together brilliantly. There are major recurring themes that pop up in Matthew. There's this uncanny connection to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Jesus, in fact, is kind of portrayed like a new, improved Moses who proclaims what kind of behavior pleases God from the side of a mountain. He paints a picture of the kingdom of heaven as something that retains some of the old teaching but includes a brand new perspective on it. Jesus, in Matthew, 
is the true Messiah, not the Messiah that people were expecting, but the true Messiah. Matthew, being the brilliant narrator that he is, doesn't just throw in a disconnected command at the end of the gospel. This is something he has been leading up to for 28 chapters. So if we're going to be responsible readers and followers of the Messiah, we need to read this text and what's gone before it uh, going in in our minds there. But one of the biggest problems in dealing with the Great Commission is that we always skip Matthew's own introduction to it. We start with the word go and forget that Jesus gave us a full sentence with some very important information to help us understand the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the commandment he was about to utter. And we need to realize how important that introduction is for orienting our minds and actions in a way that will help us fulfill Christ's desires. So let's back up a little and allow Matthew to set the scene for the Great Commission. And then we'll explore how much of a difference this can make for the church. So just listen, I'm going to give you my own translation because I want to make a certain point. And this is, of course, after the resurrection, Judas Iscariot has already committed suicide, so there are 11 apostles left. In Matthew at this point, Jesus has only appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, who we think was Jesus' mother, he told these two women to let his followers know that he had been raised from the dead and that he would go ahead of them to Galilee and meet them there. So let's start at chapter 28, verse 16. But the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus had arranged with them. And when they saw him, they fell down and worshiped him. But some of them were doubtful. But Jesus approached them and said, God has given me all authority in heaven and on earth. So go and lead people in every nation to become my followers by baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and by teaching them to follow everything I have commanded to you. And know for certain, I am always going to be with you, even until the end of time. And so Matthew gives us enough information to use our imaginations and ride along with the disciples to Galilee. What was going on in their minds? They had long believed that Jesus was the Messiah. That was Peter's great confession 12 chapters earlier. But it was immediately obvious when Peter said Messiah that they were having one of those princess bride moments. He was using the word, but it didn't really mean what he thought it meant. The Messiah, as every Jew knew, was a conqueror. He was someone who would push out the Roman invaders. He was the new David, a new king, a hero. There had been many, many others who had claimed this title, but Rome always proved them wrong. And so it seemed they had done with Jesus. Because of all the things a Messiah must be, one thing he must not be is crucified. Because everyone knows that death has the final word. Death ultimately defeats everyone. Sure, the Pharisees and others believed in an ultimate resurrection of the dead for God's people, but that was off somewhere in the distant future, and it had no immediate connection to the Messiah in their minds. So, on the word of a couple of very emotional women, whose testimony was both fantastic and questionable, the 11 disciples left Jerusalem and made the hundred-mile trek to the mountains of northern Galilee to see the implausible. Can we really blame some of them for doubting that this was anything more than an empty hope? Can't we empathize with some of them for grumbling along the road and thinking this was all a jolly waste of time, and why couldn't they just admit defeat and deal with another disappointment? Can't you just hear them saying, get real in Aramaic. But there he was, alive. Can you imagine how disorienting that must have been for these men who had seen him hanging on a cross just a short time earlier? Their entire worldview has just collapsed. The laws of physics and biology have somehow blown themselves to bits. A man whom they loved and followed, but who was brutally tortured and killed is standing there smiling 
and beckoning to them. And what does he say? Does he try to break the ice gently by sympathizing with their shock? Does he ask them about their journey? Does he catch their attention with a humorous story about his youth? No, he throws more gasoline on this perplexing fire with what in any other circumstance would have been an unforgivably blasphemous utterance by a human being. He says, God has given me all authority in heaven and on earth. Now, I know this isn't exactly the way we usually read it in English translations. All of those I've looked at follow the Greek exactly in making this a passive sentence, saying all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. But you know, the problem with passives is that they don't tell you who actually did it. They have implied actors, and in a large number of languages around the world, including the ones I used to work with in Papua New Guinea, there's no such thing as a passive construction. You have to actually come out and say who did things. It's not like politicians do when they want to admit blunders without taking responsibility for them and say, mistakes were made. In these languages, you are actually required by the rules of grammar to say who made the stupid mistakes. But the ancient Jews, because of their reverence for the name of God, were reluctant to say his name directly, so they developed ways of kind of walking around it. And one of those was to use the passive voice so that God, who was the actor, was understood without actually saying the word God. So here in the Great Commission, when Matthew uses the passive voice, we know that the person who has given this authority to Jesus is God himself. And all the disciples who were there listening to Jesus knew exactly what he meant. Now, I always instruct my students to learn to read the New Testament with Old Testament eyes. The Gospel of Matthew is chock-a-block full of Old Testament quotes and allusions, and if we don't see those, we miss out on much of the embedded meaning of the text. So when we read about authority in heaven and on earth, it should call our minds back to the picture of creation in Genesis, when God created the heavens and earth. In fact, this phrase, heaven and earth, occurs 20 times in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, in the writings of history, in the Psalms and the prophets, and 19 of those 20 occurrences refer to God's act of creation. We're talking about the entirety of the universe. And because God is the creator of the universe, he's also Lord of the universe. Now Jesus, the man who died, was buried, and has risen, has now been declared Lord of all of that creation. Try to wrap your mind around the cosmic scale of this claim. It, it's totally mind-numbing, too vast for anyone to comprehend. A human being, someone who walked on this earth only half as long as I have, a person who had a mother and father and brothers and sisters who had a group of close friends who laughed and cried and felt all the emotions we feel, a person who experienced times of joy and times of grief, who sneezed and got blisters and headaches and the hiccups, someone so much like insignificant us. This person now has authority over the universe. It should bring our minds back to what Paul said in Philippians 2. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Have you ever paused while reading this verse preceding the Great Commission to consider the vast implications of this statement? It should make us tremble with awe. But why is it so important to have this foundation in place before getting to the juicy part of the Great Commission? Does it really make a difference? I mean, we're Americans after all. We like to cut to the chase. We're interested in the bottom line. Are we told to do the same thing regardless of who's in charge of everything? 
What matters to us is what we're told to do. The important thing in the Great Commission is that we need to go make disciples, baptize, and teach. So why spend time going over all of these preliminaries? And to answer that question, I need to tell you the tale of two monks. So let's travel back in time a few hundred years. In 15th century Europe, the church, meaning of course at that time the Roman Catholic Church, was under severe threat. There had been tensions and warfare with Muslims in the East so that the trade routes, especially to India, which provided many of the spices that made food more interesting, were totally cut off. The issue wasn't so much about religious beliefs as it was about a kind of tribalism and built up hostilities. I think it would be accurate to say that the majority of people on both the, quote, Christian side and the, quote, Muslim side of this conflict had almost no theological understanding of their differences, but they did have a strong sense of wanting their team to come out on top. And I think this should sound kind of familiar to us today. But in 1492, some guy named Christopher something sailed the ocean blue and discovered by accident an entirely new continent. Later, other sea-growing explorers did complete the trip to India, so people in Europe were able to avoid the Muslim threat and still get their spices. But now they realized that there were new lands to conquer. And this was another way of their team being number one. And just so the major conquering nations on the coast, meaning Spain and Portugal, wouldn't step on each other's toes, claiming these new lands and their inhabitants as their own, Pope Alexander VI divided the world in half, with the western portion coming under Spain and the eastern portion belonging to Portugal, but all of it belonging to the Catholic Church. So both nations sent out explorers with their own troops to take these lands and put their inhabitants into subjection while they looked for new sources of food, precious metals, or other forms of wealth. And mainly as a way of ministering to the spiritual needs of the conquering militia, the explorers brought along some monks. Now, of course, as soon as they arrived in the new lands, the monks realized that the people who lived there needed to become part of the church also. So they set about converting and educating people in their new faith. So colonialism and missionary work became joined at the hip. And while it's very true that the monks were usually more compassionate toward the native peoples than the conquistadors, they were still people of their own culture who shared the same attitudes and prejudices. And the results were often not very pretty, and the church has yet to live down that legacy in many parts of the world. But you can imagine what it may have been like. This was long before there was any training in cultural awareness. The people in these subjugated lands had no education. They often wore few, if any, clothes. They had strange superstitious practices. They had no firearms or weapons capable of withstanding the Spanish or Portuguese troops. The colonial powers regarded them as something between animals and children, hardly human and vastly inferior to Europeans. So they became beasts of burden, conscripted into forced labor and other dehumanizing practices. Nothing in their training prepared the monks to know how to handle this situation. And we find that they didn't all handle it in the same way. Which leads us to our first monk in this tale, a man named Junipero Serra. Serra grew up in a working class family on the island of Mallorca off the Mediterranean coast of Spain. Even as a boy, he showed a keen interest in the Franciscan order close to his home. The friars there taught him to read and write. He was a gifted singer and a star pupil. When he was 16, he joined the Franciscan order and threw himself into their life. And even though he made a name for himself as a teacher of other monks, his greatest desire was to become a missionary to the new world. Sarah was the kind of man who believed in self-punishment to cleanse himself of sin. He would whip himself in front of a congregation or smash rocks against his chest until it was black and blue. This was a man who believed that sin had to be beaten out of a person, even if that person was himself. So in 1749, at the age of 42, 
He joined a mission to Mexico where he worked for his time in Mexico City and later traveled to Baja, California. A man of intense religious commitment, he requested and was granted the privilege of becoming an inquisitor in Mexico for the Spanish Inquisition and succeeded in having many of his own countrymen living there denounced for witchcraft, which of course resulted in their being put to death. Sin must be purged regardless of the cost. He wanted to protect the native people from the harsh abuses of the Spanish invaders, so he brought them together to live in mission centers he established where they would remain safe under his authority. But a man who was willing to beat sin out of his own body was also willing to beat it out of others. Conversions were often forced or purchased with food or trinkets. And once the natives came into the church, he dealt with disobedience with an iron rod, literally. And I mean literally, literally. Better they deal with physical pain today than spend eternity in hell. Sarah was a complicated man, a man with admirable qualities, but also a man who understood very little about grace. He was actually canonized by the Catholic Church just six years ago against the objections of Native Americans because of his treatment of their ancestors. But on to our second monk, a man named Bartolome de las Casas. De las Casas was born in 1484 in the Spanish town of Seville, you know, the one with the singing barber about 120 years before Junipero Serra was born. In his late teens, he moved with his family to the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, where he became a slave trader. A group of Dominican monks on the island protested the treatment of the, the island's inhabitants, and de las Casas, along with other slaveholders, managed to get the monks expelled from the island. They were cramping their style and costing them a lot of money. But a few years later, after personally witnessing acts of genocide and horrific cruelty on the island of Cuba while studying a passage of scripture, he realized that he and God were on opposite sides. And in a dramatic life-changing moment, he threw off his old life and values and aligned himself with God's. He traveled back to Spain to try to put an end to the atrocities by appealing to King Ferdinand, but the king died before he could make his case, so he became an activist advocating that the native peoples be treated like humans with worth and dignity. He lobbied civil and religious authorities to put an end to slavery. He made enemies among those in authority in Spain and in Rome and among the colonial forces on the island. Eventually, he obtained a land grant where he could gather a community of native islanders to protect them from the colonial abuses, but. Spanish forces attacked his settlement and killed several people there. He entered the Dominican monastery and took vows himself and later settled in Guatemala as a missionary who insisted on two things in carrying out his mission. Number one, to preach the gospel to all men and treat them as equals. And two, to assert that conversion must be voluntary and based on knowledge and understanding of the faith. He was one of the first missionaries to the New World to regard the native peoples as fully human and equal to himself. His commitment to protecting them from the abuses of his own people cost him dearly. So two monks, both Spanish missionaries to the New World, both men intensely committed to the work and expansion of their church, both trying their best to protect the native peoples from the cruel abuses of their countrymen, both highly committed to making disciples, to baptizing and teaching people in the way of the faith as they understood it. But the way they went about their work was very different. And that difference brings us back to Matthew 28, 18, where Jesus said, God has given me all authority in heaven and on earth. Because both of these men understood what they were supposed to be doing to fulfill this commission. Both of these men were committed to the point of extreme dedication to the task. Both of them were willing to endure intense hardship and personal loss to accomplish the goal, but only one of them seemed to understand whose mission it was. They both knew what to do and where they were called to do it and with whom. They knew when and they had a good sense of why, but to answer the question of how they were supposed to go about their mission work, 
They needed to understand the character of the person who ultimately was in charge of the mission. You see, if I take ownership of a task, it's my task. I'll use my own sense of values to make it happen. But if someone assigns me a task, and the ultimate responsibility for that task and how it gets done belongs to them, well, that makes a difference in how I go about doing it. If I'm building a house for myself, then I build it the way I want it. But if I'm building a house on behalf of someone else, someone whose authority I recognize, I build it the way they want it. Junipero Serra was a juggernaut. He was made a saint because of how many people he brought into the church, regardless of the hardships he faced. But you cannot read about the life of Junipero Serra and imagine him simply saying to someone, go, your sins are forgiven. Sins to Sarah required serious, painful consequences. It was better to deal with the natives through corporal punishment than to let that sin remain. He thought it was for their own good. With Hunapero Sarah, we had the cause of Christ, but not the character of Christ. For De Las Casas, even though he began his adult life as a kidnapper and slave trader, the sorriest excuse for a human being, he came to realize how much this broke the heart of Jesus. And he changed. He repented. Not the soft, peddling kind of repentance that we usually see in people today where they think they can say, sorry, and that's the end of the matter. No, De Las Casas dove headlong into counteracting his former life protecting the people in the islands and in Guatemala and introducing them to Christ. He knew the grace that had been granted to him, and so he struggled with every fiber of his being to extend that grace to others. Yes, his goal was still to make disciples, to baptize and to teach them, but to do it in a way that would bring joy to the one who sent him on the mission. His was a life of imitation, of becoming like Jesus. The first principle of the church's mission is that it is really the mission of God. A mission to reclaim and renew all of creation. We saw signs of that mission as far back as Abraham, who was told that he would be blessed so that he could be a blessing to the nations. We saw it in Solomon's temple dedication prayer where he prayed that all peoples of the earth would come to know God's name and revere him as Israel did. We saw it in the Psalms and in the prophets where the nations would look to Israel and be drawn to follow God. But we see it most clearly in Jesus. The culmination of all that the Old Testament has been leading us to. In his life, he showed us what it means to be kingdom people, to love our neighbors and our enemies, to lay down our lives for each other, to honor God as well as his children. And in dying, and being raised, we see how he has become the victor. How death and sin and all that has been distorting creation has been defeated. And more than that, how we, as his emissaries, can play a role in bringing about that new creation. We do it by allowing him to work through us. And when he does, what we do looks an awful lot like what he did and how he did it. Before we start cutting to the chase and bottom lining our mission, let's remember whose mission it is. Let's keep in mind whose authority we're acting on. If we do that, we'll not only be in step with the who, what, when, where, and why of the Great Commission, we'll be in step with how we go about it. Let's pray. God, we are in awe of the risen Christ, who is our Lord and the Lord of the universe. Give us not only the courage to go and do the things you would have us do, but the grace to do it as Jesus himself would do it. Amen.